Good morning. Welcome to Reformed Presbyterian Church. I don't know what your week was like this last week, uh, whether it was filled with good things and feeling like you know what you're doing and you know how to do life, or whether it was filled with hardship and feeling like you dropped the ball this week and you're in need of, uh, whether you, you realize you're in need of Christ. But whatever the case may be, whether you need to be reminded of the fact that you are a sinner or whether you're fully aware of that, um, whatever the case may be, our hope is that this morning our worship service would direct your eyes, would direct my eyes, would direct our hearts and our minds to Christ. Um, whether your week was good, bad, hard, or easy, we come together as a body to look to Christ as the answer, regardless of what our week was like. And so we, we come together to do that this morning. And so our hope is that your eyes and your hearts and your minds would be directed back to Christ, the answer to whatever our week was like. We approach God this morning through Psalms 107, verses 1 to 3. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from trouble. Let's pray together. Lord, we're grateful for the opportunity that we have to come together as a body this morning, as your bride, to worship you. Lord, we ask that your spirit would work in our hearts and our minds and make our worship pleasing to you this morning. Father, thank you for inviting us into a weekly time of worship where we can direct, where, where your spirit can direct our hearts and our minds and our eyes to you, where we can set aside everything that goes on on the weekly basis, the day-to-day -day basis, and we can focus on you and be reminded of who you are and what you have done, of your goodness, your consistent, daily, reliable goodness to us. We are so thankful that in a world that is constantly changing, that you never change. And there's never a question that we can rely on you. And as your children, that you look on us with favor and that you bestow on us good things and that you call us back in hard times and in good and easy times to rely on you and to look to you. We're grateful for that, Lord. We're grateful for that, though you don't need us, that you call us into relationship with you and that you desire to have that relationship. We thank you for that, Lord. May we worship you this morning in a way that is pleasing and honoring to you. Amen. <laughs>
may be seated. As we approach a most holy God, it's good and right for us to acknowledge and confess our sin together. We're going to begin with a time of silent confession of sin, and then I'll lead us after a time in a corporate confession of sin. So let's take some moments to silently go before the Lord and confess our sins to him. Let's pray together. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our fellow man in thought and word and deed, in the evil we have done and in the good we have not done, through ignorance, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins for the sake of Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us. Forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Now hear these great words of assurance from 1 Peter. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were strained like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Let's stand again as you are able as we continue our worship.
Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Amen. We become the worship of the Lord, we do so together as one people, as one voice. As an expression of that, we're going to take some time now to acknowledge and greet those who are standing near us.
Well, good morning once again and welcome to our worship service here at Reformed Presbyterian Church. If you're vacationing and watching on Zoom, we're glad that you are able to participate in that way. Uh, the elders are coming forward, or ushers coming forward to hand out some attendance registers. If you'd be so kind as to sign in to let us know that you were here. Uh, if you're new or visiting with us, we're glad that you're here. Whether this is your first, second, third, fourth time, there are some faces in the crowd this morning we haven't seen for a while. It's good to have you guys back with us. Um, if you sign in, we probably have to put you on any mailing list, but if you give us your contact info, then we can reach out and say hello to you in that way. Again, welcome, and we're glad that you're here. As we uh, go before the Lord, the Lord in prayer, just want to draw your attention to the family matters in the bulletin. Um, there's quite a few on there, and I just encourage you to look them over both today and this week. Um, let's, let's pray. Lord, again, we're grateful to come before you as your children. Um, Lord, we know that there are many among us who are uh, suffering, who are uh, struggling with various things. Uh, Lord, we know there are many that are facing uh, serious health issues and concerns, and we know that for many of them, the road has already been long and looks long in the future. Lord, we... We ask for your grace in each of those lives. We ask for your strength. We ask that you would be their strength. Lord, we, uh, we also think of the Ghana trip coming up. We ask for your direction, your guidance on that trip and for those that will be going. We pray for your grace and your strength in the preparation of it and also um, as it comes to pass. We thank you that you are our sustainer, whether we are sick, whether we are healthy, whether we're traveling on, on a mission trip or whether we're at home. We just uh, thank you for that and we look to you for our strength. Lord, as we continue in our worship service, we pray that, that you would teach us. We pray that we would worship you in uh, many ways. Um, and as we hear the word presented, we, we pray that we would grow, that we would learn, and that we would worship you in that way. In your name we ask this. Amen. The ushers will be coming forward at this time for the offering.
please turn in your Bibles, if you would, to the book of Revelation, chapter 5. Revelation is, of course, the last book in your Bible. We're looking at chapter 5 this morning, as well as a number of other passages, as evidenced by all the color sticky tabs in my Bible. Since January, we've been going through a series called Who Is This Man? We've been looking primarily through the Gospel of Luke at different passages that explain who Jesus is and what he has come to do, what he has accomplished. The last several weeks, we started to leave behind Luke and the Gospels and looked into some other books of Scripture, although we're still looking somewhat, still working somewhat chronologically as we've been going through Jesus' life and ministry. We've worked into his trial, his innocence, his rejection, his being forsaken, and this morning, his death, his being slain. In the coming weeks, we'll look at his resurrection and exaltation. And we're using other books of the Bible to examine these events from all sorts of different angles and to see where they fit in the overall narrative of Scripture. Now, I know that when the preacher says, turn to Revelation, some of you have a visceral reaction to that. It's either, oh boy, or it's, oh, good, oh, good, oh, good, oh, good. So let me just disappoint all of you right off the bat. We will not be getting into the weeds of Revelation. There are a number of threads that weave their way through the book of Revelation, and we're going to be looking at one of them, and that is, who is this man, Jesus? So we will not be answering the questions, what is the significance of the right hand? Who is on the throne? What is the scroll? What are the seven seals? Who is the mighty angel? What are the seven horns, the seven eyes, the 24 elders, the living creatures, the harp, the bulls? We're not answering those questions this morning. This is not a deep exposition of revelation. We are simply going to answer why did Jesus die? And what did he accomplish in his death? And what does that have to do with us today? So to that end, let's read Revelation 5 together. It should be in your bulletins as well as on the screen behind me. Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Then I looked, and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing." And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. Let's pray. Oh Lord, our God, what a mighty passage this is. What a mysterious and awesome passage this is. Lord, give us eyes to see that which we are to see this morning. Let our hearts be okay with certain questions being unanswered, at least for now. 
and help us to focus in on the person and the work of Jesus. That we may echo these prayers, that we may echo this praise. We do it in fullness of spirit. We pray this in Jesus' name. So just looking at the first paragraph of Revelation 5, we can say a few things with certainty. One, there is a scroll. What is the scroll? I'm not going to tell you. You can ask Jim Harris next week. (laughs) But there is a scroll. And whatever it is, the author of this letter, who's John, and the mighty angel in verse 2, really, really, really want the scroll to be open. We know that much. Whatever it is, they really, really, really want it to be opened. And no one can open it. And so they weep because it's that important. But in verse 5, one of the elders says, weep no more. Weep no more. Why? Why? Because the Lion of Judah, the Root of David, the one who has conquered, he is worthy to open it. This is great news. Whatever this scroll is, it's so important. And there is one who is worthy. It's the Lion of Judah, the Root of David. And if you know Genesis 49 and Isaiah 11, you know who that is. And if you don't, take a wild guess. (laughs) Take a wild guess, church. Who is the Lion of Judah and the Root of David and the one who is worthy to open the scroll? Really glad we got that one right. Okay, so spoiler, it's Jesus. Weep no more. Jesus is worthy to open the scroll, whatever that is. But stay with me here. Let's move on. Let's take a look at who Jesus is. So John looks and wants to see who this this entity is that can open the scroll. And in verse 6 it says, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain. I'm not sure what comes into your mind's eye when you try to picture this, try to visualize a lamb standing as though it had been slain. Forget about seven horns and seven eyes. This is already difficult to imagine, just to visualize. But these are the words of Scripture. And what's more important than trying to get a visual on this is trying to understand what is meant by lamb and slain. This is a lamb standing, so it has been slain. That's what he looks like. And what he does is that he takes the scroll. Verse 7, he went and he took the scroll. Now, he doesn't open it yet. He doesn't open it until chapter 6. But just by taking the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders burst into song. They burst into praise. Because finally, the opening of the scroll is imminent. It's about to happen. And they can't contain themselves. And in verses 11 and 12, the myriads and myriads of angels burst into a similar song of praise. At last, the root of David, the line of Judah, the lamb who's been slain, at last the scroll will be opened, for he's worthy. Why? What makes him worthy? Look at your Bibles. Look at verse 9. What makes them worthy? They sing out, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open the seals. For, or because, you were slain. You were killed. And by your blood you ransomed people for God. From every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God and they shall reign on the earth. That's why he's worthy, because he was slain. And because he ransomed people for God and because he made them a kingdom and priests. There are many things that Jesus accomplished by his dying. This passage gives us three of them. We're ransomed, we're made into a kingdom, and we're made into priests. Let's take some time to look into that. So we're trying to answer the question, why did Jesus die? What did he accomplish in all of that? One, we are ransomed, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God. 
The English word ransom, that's a translation of the Greek word, which John would have written. The Greek word is agorazo. It means to buy, simply to buy. It's the verb form of the Greek word agora, which means the marketplace. Every village and town in the ancient world would have some sort of agora, the marketplace where everyone came to sell and to buy their goods. Think of like an open-air bazaar somewhere or a big farmer's market. That's the agora. And the verb form, agorazo, to marketplace, to buy. It's the same word that shows up in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, and 20. You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. 1 Corinthians 7, 23, you were bought with a price. Do not become bondservants of men. 2 Peter 2.1, false prophets arose among the people, even denying the master who bought them. He purchased us with his blood. It's economic language. He purchased us. He ransomed us. Not with money. Not with gold and silver, of which he has plenty. Not with cattle, of which he has plenty. But with his very blood. He purchased us, and therefore, we are his. If you buy something, you own it. He bought us. He owns us. Now, we don't like that language. That's the language of Scripture. That's the truth of the matter. You are not your own. You don't belong to you. You belong to God if he has bought you with his blood. We owe him our very lives. If someone risks their life to save yours or to save your child's, or if someone gives their life to save yours, we commonly say we owe them. And if I, as a chief of sinners chief of sinners deserving of death and the very righteous one himself dies in my place I owe him I am his and we don't like that so often so many of us we act like we are the captains of our souls that I decide what Kevin does But no, he bought us and we are his. He stood in our place, he died on our behalf in a very substitutionary way. We traded places. If you turn to Genesis 22, some of you know Genesis 22, Abraham who sacrificed Isaac. That's the story. God says to Abraham, Verse 2, Genesis 22, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Take your only son who was miraculously born to you and go and kill him on a mountaintop. And we know from later passages that Abraham understood that to mean, well, somehow God will resurrect him. But notice what God says. Notice how he qualifies who is to be sacrificed. Take your son. Which son? Your only son. Which only son? The one whom you love. He didn't need that many qualifiers, but he gave them. Why? Because Abraham isn't the only person in the story who has an only son whom he loves. God does too. God has an only son whom he loves. And at Jesus' baptism, God speaks from the clouds and he says, this is my beloved son. You know about Abraham's beloved son. Remember Isaac? Well, this one is mine. This is Jesus. This one is mine. 
And how do you prove your love? Verse 12, God says to Abraham, don't lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. The act of offering the only son proved Abraham's love and fear for God. And so with Jesus, we have, this is my son, my only son, and I will prove my love for my people by offering him. The father offers the only son. The son willingly goes to the cross on our behalf to prove just how much God loves his people. It's amazing. As they climb the mountain, Isaac says, well, where's the lamb? And Abraham tells him, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering. I don't know if Abraham really knew what he meant when he said that. In verse 13, they find a lamb in the thicket. And so they sacrifice that one instead. But there's a greater fulfillment of Abraham's prophecy about God providing a lamb, isn't there? There's a greater fulfillment because there's a greater sacrifice, because there's a greater provision, because there's a greater need. And so then John the Baptist, in John 1.29, John the Baptist sees Jesus coming, and he says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It's as though John is saying, This is the Son, this is the Lamb. This is the one who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one who's the hopes and the fears of all the years coming together in one person. Jesus Christ, who is fully God and fully man. This is the one. It's also the lamb that we read about a few weeks ago in Isaiah 53. The lamb who is oppressed and afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, like a sheep that is silent before its shears, so he opened not his mouth. It's that lamb. It's the lamb of Isaiah 53, 11. The lamb who died as an atoning sacrifice. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. It's the lamb that takes on the iniquities. It's the scapegoat lamb. And gives us his righteousness in his place. And he bears our sin in our place. It's that lamb. John says, behold the lamb of God. It's that lamb. He's also the Passover lamb. The book of Exodus, God's people, the Israelites, are slaves in Egypt. God sends plagues on the Egyptians and on Pharaoh to convince them that he's doing wrong and to release his people. And the tenth and final plague will be the death of the firstborn in every house including the house of the Israelites, unless God tells them, I will pass through the land of Egypt. This is Exodus 12, 12. I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And on all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. The lamb dies, and the blood is smeared on the doorpost. And so the wrath of God passes over the people. That's what the blood of the lamb does. And the Passover lamb has been celebrated for centuries upon centuries. It's a sign of God's mercy falling on them because God's wrath fell on another. It was the lamb who was slain so that God's wrath would pass over. Isaiah understood this as a redemption story. Isaiah 43, God says, Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I've bought you. I've called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers they shall not overwhelm you. The image there is of passing through the Red Sea. You're passing through the waters. You shall not drown because you're the Lord's. You are mine. I will protect you. After all, I bought you. I redeemed you. In 
Years later, the celebration of the Passover, sometime around the year 30 AD, Jesus is celebrating the Passover with his friends and disciples. And during that time, he says, there's a new covenant, and it's in my blood. It's no longer the blood of actual lambs, because Jesus is the true lamb, the lamb of God. And so a new thing is happening. So we get to Revelation 5, and we read of a lamb who was slain. We realize this is the lamb who's been talked about for a long time, ever since Abraham, ever since Exodus, ever since the Passover, ever since the suffering servant. It's the same lamb that John pointed out. said, this one, this is the lamb of God. This is the son. This is the lamb who was slain. Because that's what happens to lambs at critical moments of redemption throughout history. And it's what had to happen for our ransom from our son. But something changes in Revelation 5 to the story. It takes another twist. Same theme, another twist. Something changes. Now think back for a minute to Mount Moriah, Abraham's almost sacrifice of Isaac. The lamb dies instead. Who was ransomed? Isaac. Think about the Passover and the lamb who was slain. Who was ransomed by that lamb? Israel. Now think about the lamb who died on the cross. Who was ransomed by that lamb's death? Revelation 5, 9 tells us, you were slain, and by your blood, you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. This is no longer just redemption for Israel. This is no longer just good news for Israel. It's for everybody. It's for every tribe, every nation, every language, every people group that there is. This is for everybody. And the story of God's redemption grows and grows and expands and does not stop until it finds its fulfillment in the international people of God. We have been ransomed, not just you and I in this room. That ransom is sufficient for all the world. Revelation 5.10, the blessing continues. Not only are we ransomed through his death, Revelation 5.10, and you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God. So what did Jesus' death accomplish? One, we are ransomed. Two, we are made into a kingdom. His death results in us being made into a kingdom. The Exodus event and the Passover resulted in the formation of the kingdom of Israel. Before Exodus, God's people were just simply Abraham's family. A really big family, but really just a family. And it was after the Exodus that they were really made into a nation, a state, a kingdom. But now it's all the peoples of the world, all the tribes, languages, peoples, and nations of the world coming into one kingdom, this melting pot of a kingdom called God's kingdom, with Jesus as the king, And we still keep our distinctives. God created humanity as a kaleidoscope in all of his creativity with all sorts of traits and qualities. But we also have an intense new unity centered on the cornerstone, the lamb, the king, Jesus Christ. Much of what the New Testament is describing is a new political reality. We don't often like to think of it that way, but it's a political reality. It's a kingdom with a king, with its own ethical standards, with its own governing structure. And that new kingdom, that political reality, is manifested in our time as the 
church. Not just RPC, but the church globally. With all of its imperfections. Did you know that the church has imperfections? There's a few. With all of its messiness, with all of the brokenness and sinfulness of its members, its citizens, the church is the expression of the kingdom of God in our day. And because that's so, it should be the primary identification that we have. Who do you most identify with? Should be the people of God, this new kingdom of which we are citizens. Our primary, not our only, but our primary. More than our country, more than our family, more than our school, more than our favorite sports team. Primarily, who we identify with should be and is, whether we like it or not, the people of God. Because we are the ones that have been bought and ransomed, and we are his. The third thing, we are made into priests. Priests to our God. Again, I'm not sure what image comes into your mind when you hear that. Depending on your church background, you may have different ideas of what a priest looks like. But we are made into priests. Hebrews 10, I think, describes what that looks like for us. Out of of everywhere in Scripture we could turn, I think Hebrews 10 probably does it the best for us, most succinctly. And Hebrews 10 is basically all about Christ's sacrifice being better and Christ's priesthood being better than all the Old Testament sacrifices and priesthoods before him. In Hebrews 10.4 it says, For it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. The old priesthood, the old sacrificial system was this ongoing, repeated process of sacrificing animals. But it never really took away sin. The Lamb of God is the one who takes away sins. It was only pointing toward a greater sacrifice to come. In Hebrews 10, 11, the author writes this, every priest stands daily at his service. It's talking about the Old Testament priest. Offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Verse 14, for by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Jesus' sacrifice is a one and done sacrifice. Jesus' sacrifice is, is an eternal and infinite sacrifice because he's an eternal and infinite God sacrificing for our eternal and infinite sin. But his sacrifice is sufficient to atone for all of it. So there's no more sacrifice. That's why we don't do what they did in Leviticus anymore. Because it's been done. Once and for all time. So what does our priesthood look like today? Hebrews 10, 19. 10, 18, I'll back up. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he has opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Did you catch the priestly language in there? What are we to do? We have confidence to enter the holy places. Who enters the holy places in the Old Testament? Nobody, except the high priest. Nobody goes in there. You go in there, you've seen Raiders of the Lost Ark where their faces melt, like that's what happens. At least that's how I imagine it. No one goes into the holy places, except for the, great high, except for the high priest once a year. 
And when he does, he sprinkles himself with the blood of animals first. So he's at least temporarily, ritually clean. But what does this say? We have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus is sufficient for us. And we don't do it repeatedly. It's a once for all. Now we can enter into the most holy place. Imagine being a Jewish person and hearing this. For millennia, no one goes into the holy place. God is too holy. That is so off limits. And now we can go. And to do so with confidence. We go through the curtain. There was a curtain around the most holy place. Now Luke's gospel tells us that when Jesus died, there was an earthquake and the curtain was torn in two. There's no longer a curtain. Now we can enter into the most holy of places. We can approach God the Father. Because Jesus has gone before us, because his blood atones for us, we can enter into the holy place. We can offer worship to the Father in the name of the Son. We can offer prayers to the Father in the name of the Son. That's why we pray in the name of the Son. Because it's by his blood that we can even enter into the Father's presence. But we can. And so our priesthood is remembering that we have been sprinkled clean by the blood of Jesus. And we don't have to redo that. It's done. And we have the privilege and the joy and the opportunity to go before the Father in worship and in prayer. One of the reasons that we pray for our community and for non-believers is because they can't. You can't enter the most holy place without being covered in blood. But we can. Now sometimes God who knows their hearts and their minds and their desires, sometimes by his common grace, he fulfills those. But they can't truly pray. They can't truly approach the Father like we can. And so we go on behalf of those who can't and intercede for them because we love our neighbors and we pray for our enemies. So by Jesus' death, we are ransomed, we are bought, we are his. We are made into a kingdom that's expressed as the church. And we have a priesthood and a responsibility to worship the Father in the name of the Son. What does Jesus receive by his dying? To the songs of the elders and the living creatures and the angels, and even the songs that we sung earlier this morning. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. Jesus receives worship. Worship comes from worth-ship. He is worthy. He gets worship. And he alone. One of our rallying cries, Soli Deo glory, to God alone be the glory. No one else gets the glory for what he's accomplished because only he could accomplish it and only he has accomplished it. So to him alone be the glory. He receives worship. Look, books have been written trying to apply these principles and what they could mean for us. Let me just offer a couple observations by means of application. All of these things have been accomplished for us. Ransom, kingdom, priesthood. They all run counter to many of our cultural values and our deeply ingrained societies. He bought us. We are his. That runs very counter to our deeply ingrained understanding of self, of freedom, of autonomy, etc., etc. Again, we like to think that we're in charge here. And nobody gets to intrude. But 
God does. He owns you. If you're his, that means you give up certain rights. It's part of the reason I'm a pastor, to be honest. Because 1 Corinthians 6.19 has been one of those verses I can't get out of my head as much as I've tried. You are not your own, Kevin. I really like to be. But you're not. And so there are things that you give up for his sake. If he bought you with a price, it's the very least you can do. He is worthy. We are transformed into a kingdom, a community. And again, this runs very counter to our notions of individualism. You know, the American rugged individualist mindset that we have. We love those movies and those stories. A rugged individual who can overcome. God says, no. No, you're part of a body. You're part of a family, the family of God. Just like your real family, you don't always get to choose who's in your family. It also runs counter to our deeply ingrained consumeristic mindset. We just have like an a la carte approach to life. We'll take from there, we'll take from there. We'll never, we don't need that, we don't need that. We'll take this, but not that. Think of how many options we have when we just turn on the television set. We get to choose. You go to the grocery store. You got eight million different options for what cereal you want to buy. We get to choose. We don't like this business. We just take our business to someone else. So we live in a place where there's lots of businesses. And we live in a place where there's lots of churches. So we don't like this church. We just find another one. We don't like the programs or the preaching or the people or the music. We just go down the road, find another church. It's deeply ingrained in us. And we're often too careless with the church because we're too careless with the idea of we are transformed into a community, a kingdom, with a king. And lastly, we're made into this priesthood that looks back on Christ and relies on Christ. And this runs counter to our efforts to justify ourselves. If we work hard enough, if we do good enough, then we're owed something. I'm going to tell you, God owes you and me nothing. Nothing. We owe him everything. Our sacrifices, our religious efforts, they will never, ever, ever be enough. That's why the psalmist says, cease striving or be still and know that I am God. Because that is enough. And so we proclaim Christ alone and we proclaim to God be the glory alone. Because it's by grace alone that we have been saved, we have been redeemed, we have been rescued. Let's pray. Our great God and Father, we're so grateful for the way you have demonstrated your love for us time and time and time again. Help us to reflect on the meaning of the slain lamb and all that those words entail. And all that it has entailed throughout the entire history of Scripture, from Genesis through Revelation. The Lamb is slain. The Lamb is God Himself, who willingly went to the cross. And it's in His name that we pray. Amen.
hear these words from the book of Jude. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. There are quite a few announcements. I encourage you to look in your bulletin in detail at that. Um, just going to highlight several for you. Uh, the fellowship hour that was scheduled for today has been canceled, so don't go out there looking for refreshments today. Um, the, there are Sunday school teachers for the children and youth needed uh, for this fall. Please talk to Alicia Weaver uh, today, if possible. Uh, please talk to her today. There are both teachers and helpers needed for the fall. Um, so please consider whether you would be uh, able and willing to serve in that, those roles. Uh, the RPC uh, Summer Picnic is going to be a chicken barbecue this summer. It's on August 13th at Reamstown Park. There's more details on that. Um, you can sign up uh, starting today. Uh, the Family Fellowship Night is this week. If you recall, that's on Tuesdays. Um, it is this week at 5.30. You can, there's a couple ways to sign up for that. And lastly, uh, the, hopefully you received an email, but if not, it's in the bulletin. The Pastoral Search Committee has been formed. Uh, please be in prayer for that, for that group. Uh, Joe Antarante is chairing that group. Pray for him specifically and pray for the whole group as they um, lead us, as represent us as a congregation to searching and uh, finding our next pastor. Um, I believe that's all I have. We thank you for being a part of our worship service this morning. Have a blessed Lord's Day. Mm -hmm.